one of the perks of dating me is that if you're playing Metal Gear Solid V, I will happily go and S rank all of the missions that you don't want to replay and bring your save file closer and closer to 100%, helping you unlock all the best gear so that you have more toys to play with as you progress. This was the situation that my girlfriend was in over last month, after gradually making her way through the whole series ever since I first introduced them to her last year. However, my girlfriend is actually pretty good at Metal Gear, so there wasn't too much for me to do that she didn't already handle for herself before I got the chance to. So with only a couple missions left to S-Rank and her drawing closer and closer to 100% completion, I decided to load up my old save file and see how much further she'd have to go before her army was as strong as mine had gotten. Well, seeing all of my old data there on the screen again, I was just instantly sucked back in. I'd been working on really honing my skills as a Metal Gear player over the last few months, getting all the achievements and highest ranked playthroughs in MGS 1, 2, and 3. I'd already gotten all the achievements in MGSV a couple years back, but there was one side of the game that I never touched in all my hundreds of hours of playtime. FOB missions. The never-ending cold war that every single player is participating in. The central premise of MGSV is that you go around various conflict regions pursuing revenge on a mysterious figure, all while recruiting soldiers from around the battlefield into a private army, Diamond Dogs. Building up this army and getting your revenge are one and the same. Well, after Mission 21, Mother Base, the place that Diamond Dogs calls its home, is raided by a rival private army, and your staff must be rescued. In order to make sure that this doesn't happen again, the player is told to create an FOB, a forward operating base. By having multiple bases like this, the true location of Mother Base, the heart of your forces, is easier kept a secret. Not to mention, creating FOBs will simply allow you to stockpile more weapons, more resources and materials, more riches and more staff members, allowing your army to grow far beyond what was possible before. Well, once you create your first FOB, after Mission 22, you've officially entered the online side of MGSV. Everyone who's gotten up to this point, about a third of the way through the game, has at least one FOB. Some players who bought the microtransactions or saved up the free premium currency packages for long enough have as many as four FOBs, and each one of these players can be targeted by you now. When raiding another player's FOB, you can steal staff members or materials or weapons, pretty much any of the in-game resources from them, and add them to your own power. It sounds like a great deal, but here's the catch. If another player's security team spots you on their FOB, that player is given the option to retaliate. They then have 30 real-life days to go to one of your FOBs and steal as much of your resources as they possibly can, and if they're able to successfully infiltrate the core of your FOB, they're able to take back all of the things you stole from them in the first place. In other words, getting caught in the wrong player's FOB can set you back big time, and MGSV is a slow, slow game. We're talking multiple real-life days of the game slowly ticking away its numbers in the background, being completely set back if the other player hits you hard enough. Or maybe you've got all sorts of high-level staff members on your security team, and uh, out of lust for revenge, the player you first raided comes in and kills every single one of them. That can cost you tons of actual playtime spent recruiting these staff members on the battlefield, stealing them from other players, micromanaging them in the staff management menus, not to mention all the money you spend just feeding, training, and arming these people. What this all boils down to is that FOB missions are the ultimate risk versus reward gambit. You start off with basic reconnaissance, going over your target's security regimen, the equipment and talent of their guards, the security devices they've employed to make infiltrating their FOB harder and harder, and deciding if it's a base that you, as a player, are skilled enough to break into. Then you go over the other player themselves. How many FOB infiltrations have they completed? Are they going to be skilled enough to break through your security and defenses if they decide to retaliate against you? Once you start dealing with serious players, it's wise to even start looking at your target's Steam profiles and see if they're online, playing the game, or if they haven't touched MGSV in months. Risk management and assessment is easily the most important part of FOB infiltration, and maintaining your place amongst the player base. With risk assessment comes deterrence, however. I did mention that this was more of a cold war than anything else. So there are three main factors that go into deterrence. First off, security. 
when deciding who to go after, as I said, you can see a very basic overview of the target's security layout. How many security cameras, UAVs, landmines, motion sensors, gun emplacements, and laser grids they have deployed on each platform, as well as the amount of guards that are stationed there. The number of guards that you see presented is bolstered by the decoys that they have deployed. As you can see, by adding more decoys, it will appear to my enemies that I have more guards. You can also see if the security regimen is focused around long range, close range, or medium range tactics. Medium range is usually the easiest to handle, and long range is usually the hardest, but it depends on the layout of the platform. So using your own experience as a reference to mix and match what range tactics are used where is a good practice. Lastly, you can see the equipment grade that the enemy's security force is using. This doesn't just apply to weapons and armor either, it simply reflects the maximum grenade that the soldiers are allowed to use. It doesn't necessarily reflect what's actually available to them. So for instance, I've got the grade A battle dress unlocked, and so my security forces wear this powerful armor that dramatically reduces the effectiveness of all but the most powerful weapons. A little secret is that this is the only piece of grade 8 equipment that I've managed to unlock for my guards so far. However, if you looked at my profile on the FOB menu and see that 8, it could mean that my guards just have crappy armor and some decent guns, but it could also mean that my security regimen includes near-invincible armor, fantastic guns, laser grids that are a nightmare to bypass, motion sensors that blare an alarm as soon as you step within 8 feet of them, highly responsive and durable gun cameras, two freely placed cameras to act as surprise mix-ups, highly durable UAV drones, and 8 claymores with custom locations to shut down certain passageways. Because the enemy is only able to see what the highest grade of equipment you have access to is, you're able to kind of puff your chest out a little bit and present a credible risk that's much higher than the actual risk you pose. And thus, you have deterrence. I, like most players who engage with this side of MGSV, look much scarier than I actually am in game. And that's exactly how I intend to keep it. Many players who take the game seriously end up setting up their Steam profiles to private so that you can never tell when they're online and might be ready to jump in and defend their base when you try to invade it. It's all about presenting a credible risk that's greater than the actual risk you present. Next up, there's the more eye-catching side of deterrence. Nukes. Every nuke you possess, up to a maximum of 16, gives you a single day of full immunity to retaliatory attacks from other players. That is to say, if I get caught invading you, but I have 10 nukes, you have to wait 10 days out of the 30 day retaliation period before you can strike back at me. This gives me more time to bolster my defenses and prepare for your attack, and wastes 10 potential days of you feeling like hopping on the game and getting your revenge against me. However, if you've maintained hero status, as indicated by this little crown icon, by going out of your way to avoid killing people and never creating nukes of your own, you'll be able to retaliate against me no matter how many nukes I have. If I see that you have a high number of successful FOB infiltrations and that you don't have any nukes, there's a good chance that you're classified in-game as a hero, and then any nukes I develop won't do me any good in deterring you from a revenge infiltration, and thus I'm deterred from raiding your base in the first place. I, of course, have opted to not use any nukes. There's a whole host of reasons why, none of which are really reflected in-game, so I won't get into it too much here, but I've chosen to maintain hero status, just for the record, want to clear my name on this. What the existence of nukes has done to this never-ending game of infiltration is separated the player base into two casts. You have the nuclear arm players engaging with mechanics that are designed to make it easier for them to bully low-level players out of their supplies, knowing that they won't be advanced enough to be classified as a hero, and will thus have little to no recourse in retaliating back against you, and then you have the heroes who choose to not maintain a nuclear arsenal and are poised to better handle the nuclear equipped players and hopefully steal and decommission those nukes, giving the little guys a better chance to be able to exact their own revenge. Basically, one group of players is punching way above their weight, limiting their tactics to cleaner, less lethal means of infiltration with the aim of disarming nukes and growing in power, and another group of players who punches below their weight, using their nukes as a shield to bully lower level players out of their resources, killing however many security guards that they see fit to make their jobs even a little bit easier. This is a really, really cool dynamic. It makes players like me feel this weird sense of pride every time I go after a dangerous high-level base and deliberately stop myself from using tactics that would make my job way easier for the sake of saving a few NPC lives and maintaining my heroism. And it makes the players who choose to use nukes feel like evil James Bond villains, much more in line with the 
actual story of Metal Gear and the Diamond Dogs' revenge-fueled descent into hell. So, what's it all for anyways? All these materials and resources and staff members were stealing from each other all day. What do we actually use them for? Well, you can probably guess this, but we use them to get more powerful. The biggest goal is simply upgrading all your FOBs to the max level. Building up all your platforms so that they have the maximum number of struts not only allows for you to house more staff members, pushing your potential higher and higher, but it makes them way more secure. On the left side, you can see my route through a platform with just one strut, and on the right, you can see my route through a platform with the maximum of four struts. I have to deal with substantially more threats, and I have to use my limited time more and more recklessly and stretch my resources thinner and thinner the more distance I have to travel. Needless to say, this stuff seriously plays into the credible risk stuff that I was talking about earlier. It doesn't matter what type of security equipment and staff you've got, if a platform has only one strut, I'll be retaliating against you, and I'll be winning every time without much effort. The only issue is that this process of building up your FOBs is slow. I mean incredibly slow. Even if you had all the resources you'd ever need, which you won't, constructing a new strut for one of your platforms takes several real-life days. Funnily enough, the game only serves up players who have a similar amount of experience rating bases as you do, and because of this, it's actually prudent to avoid letting your espionage rank get too high until you've built up all your platforms to have all four struts. Unfortunately, I don't really have the self-control for that. I've been pushing myself further and further, trying to get my rank as high as I can, and trying to refine my own skills, so my rank is really high for someone who still has 14 platforms that aren't maxed out. And as I climb those ranks, I get more and more notifications that people have snuck through one of my platforms without ever being detected, meaning I have no way of retaliating. Frankly, I'm a walking red flag right now. I am exactly the type of player that I would raid just as a warm-up in the morning, and I'm only being shown to players who are more capable of handling my defenses. I'm losing the arms race because I've got eyes bigger than my stomach. No amount of technical skills and sneaking around will make up for the weaknesses that I'm trying to fix up. But fixing up those weaknesses is going to take a long, long time, and I'm going to make a lot of highly skilled enemies in the process. Stealing from other players is the only way to get the quantities that I need for a project like this in any sort of realistic time frame, so standing in a field with a target painted on my back is more or less the only option I have if I want to make up for how reckless I was a few weeks ago when I first began development on these new FOBs. So let's talk about the timescale stuff. I keep talking about the game mechanics in terms of real life days and even whole months, which is pretty crazy for what is primarily a single player game. I don't think it'll be too controversial to say that this mainly exists to facilitate microtransactions. You can, of course, use premium currency to speed up most of these processes that take place over multiple days. However, I really just can't bring myself to dislike this system. I think there's a little bit of genius to it, and I kind of believe that these wait times would still be in the game even if there weren't any microtransactions to circumvent them. Let me explain why. So first off, you've got the stuff I mentioned earlier. Since development of your security forces takes time, there's real tension to deciding how and when to retaliate against your rivals. Every day you wait to retaliate, you give them more chances to develop equipment or struts that will make your infiltration harder, but you also give yourself more time to bolster your own security and make sure you'll be okay in case you get caught in your retaliatory infiltration and give them the chance to retaliate right back against you. That's cool. It adds to the feeling that this ecosystem of players is, in fact, an ecosystem, ever-changing and ever-dynamic. But these multi-day wait times also apply to developing the highest equipment for you to use, and this just keeps me completely hooked by always giving me something to look forward to tomorrow. Whereas in any other game, I would have abandoned the grind by now, in most games that have things to grind towards, I end up fixating on the grind, playing for several hours a day, getting more and more powerful, until I just get bored. It's like, yeah, I earned all of this stuff in Helldivers because I grinded for it, but the fact that I can get an equipment upgrade and immediately start using it and continue the grind makes unlocking this stuff feel so much less substantial, like it's just another step in the path towards something higher. I don't remember when I unlocked this shotgun in Helldivers, but you bet your ass I remember when I finally got my grade 9 sleeve grenades after having to wait 10 days for them to develop. 
I was hyped as hell. Not only can I carry 12 of them into each mission now, but their effect radius is absurdly high. In the right circumstances, I can clear an entire platform with just two or three of these things at almost no risk to myself. I grinded enough to finally be able to start development on them, and the immediate satisfaction of that was just getting that timer started. I could feel good about that, close out the game and open it up the next day, and start working my way towards the next goal, and get the next timer started. And all the time I'm grinding, I'm looking at my lame old tier 7 sleep grenades and hyping myself up for the upgrade, thinking about how my tactics are going to change once I get these new grenades. I can't really explain why this system is so appealing to me beyond that, but I really do feel like these long waits are what's enabled a grindy ass game like this to hold my attention for so much longer than something like Helldivers did, even with its constant content updates. On top of that, logging in every day just to check on a couple things, move some staff members around, see if I've been invaded, go over the security logs, and attempt to shore up my weaknesses by tweaking the surprisingly deep security settings. All of it really makes me feel like I'm running a private army, and I have to just check in daily with just the right amount of administrative managerial responsibilities. But let's go back to something I said a moment ago. Hyping myself up for the upgrade, thinking about how my tactics are going to change once I get these new grenades. Could a simple upgrade to an item I'm already using religiously really change my tactics enough that I have to think about it so much? Well, yes, actually. Let me tell you right now, I've never really been a competitive gamer, other than a few years of Counter-Strike back in the day, but I never have thought about the tactics I use in a game as much as I have over the course of my progression as an FOB infiltrator. This stuff gets nuanced. In the single player open world side of MGSV, I and most other players tend to stick to pretty simple loadouts. Sneaking around in this game isn't exactly hard, so playing non-lethally is usually as simple as a trank pistol, trank sniper, rubber bullets AR, sleep grenade, box, magazines, and decoys. Bring D-Dog with you so the enemies can't surprise you, and you're set to handle pretty much any challenge in this game without much difficulty, save for the occasional boss encounter. You've got about a million options in this game, and they're all super fun, but the optimal strategies for each situation are pretty quick to surface, even early in the game. And once you land on those strategies, it's hard to experiment more without feeling like you're just slowing yourself down. In FOB missions, however, the depth of those seemingly simple stealth mechanics gets pushed to its absolute limit. The stakes are much higher, reflex mode is incredibly short, guards have better armor, cameras, motion alarms, and UAVs come into play, and suddenly every little nuance of how these guards think and react becomes extremely important. You need to learn exactly when to throw a magazine to make a flashlight guard turn around while he's investigating your shadowy figure. You need to learn how the form up mechanics work to make multiple guards investigate a single distraction. You need to learn how and when you're able to draw enemies' attention away from your position during a combat state. In fact, you even have to learn how to avoid putting enemies into a caution state. Sure, nobody's seen you and you haven't caused any harm, but all it takes is one plume of smoke, one missing materials container, one destroyed camera being noticed by a guard, and the targeted player gets notified that they're being raided and can move in to defend. Even if you're staying out of sight and not getting caught, it pays to make sure you aren't raising even the slightest amount of suspicion from the enemy security detail. All of these factors combined lead to a situation where yeah, a slightly larger effect radius on my sleep grenades does matter a lot. An extra 10% damage for my silenced air shotgun changes everything sometimes. The camouflage I use and the time of day I infiltrate become extremely important. Even something as simple as how long the barrel of my gun is can make or break an infiltration, and I mean that. It costs me 15 minutes of perfect stealth efforts. The thing that really elevates the tension is that, unlike in the offline open world experience, there isn't one clear strategy or loadout you can confidently carry into every mission. Sure, there's probably a theoretical best sniper rifle, best non-lethal shotgun, best trank pistol, but you could absolutely make an argument for stealth players that use grenade launchers, or the rocket fist, or revolvers, or really anything else in the game. Each weapon type has situations where it's the clear winner, and the decision to take one weapon versus another needs to be made on a case-by-case, base-by-base, uh, basis. Tranquilizers are functionally useless against high-level, lethally configured guards, but sleep gas doesn't do a thing against non-lethally configured guards. 
sure, you can sleep grenade lethal guards, but if you have to shoot one, there really isn't a quiet way to do it, regardless of whether you have a suppressor or not. Sniper guard regimens can super easily kill a run, but if you cover up your thermal footprint with a sneaking suit and use smoke grenades, they can be completely bypassed with hardly any effort. Shotgun guard regimens will very often surprise you around a corner and take you down in just one shot if you don't take absurdly heavy armor. There are pros and cons to every infiltration strategy, and pros and cons to every defense strategy. So rather than using the same loadouts every time, you're going to end up using almost everything in the game at some point or another if you want to truly excel at infiltration. And that's to say nothing of the nuance introduced by the risk, but you could enter PvP at any moment when doing this stuff. At any point, a player could just show up to defend, or you could be tasked with defending. You never know when you're just going to be fighting another player who has just as many nuanced tactics at their disposal as you do. I even made this chart indicating what each security equipment grade could potentially entail. So if, for example, I see that an FOB has level 6 security equipment, I know for a fact that I won't be going up against motion detecting anti-theft units or custom placed mines or cameras, and so I'll know that I'm probably safe to not worry about triggering a caution state and losing the ability to automatically mark nearby cams, and that I can rest easily knowing that I won't trigger any alarms by walking near the cargo areas, and so I can use faster tactics and rely on my shotgun more than my sleep grenades. As you complete your infiltrations, you're going to have to learn a lot of information. Where the most dangerous areas are, how guards interact, what your own personal weaknesses are as a player, whether or not it's worth risking an enemy defender coming in to destroy mortars early, whether you can get away with stealing extra cargo containers, all sorts of information. Then, what's really cool is that you can use that knowledge to bolster your own security configurations. Take my support platform as an example. There's this one section I pass through on almost every single run, where I'm trying to focus on the guards that are blocking the entrance to this hangar that I need to access, and so I've placed a security camera in an incredibly devious spot so that a player who's fixated on the three guards I have stationed there will be caught off guard when they realize that this little camera around the corner was the real threat all along. Or just up ahead in the lower area, just before the goal. But by default, there's always going to be a claymore here and here, as well as a security camera covering this catwalk. So the easiest way to get through this room is to hop over the handrail and sneak through the foliage. But I've hidden a claymore directly under that handrail, so that you're practically guaranteed to either die in the explosion or draw the attention of the distant guards you were trying to close the distance on for a clean silent shotgun takedown. As you play and play and play, you're going to become intimately familiar with your own weaknesses and which situations put you at the highest risk, and exploiting those weaknesses to try and force your enemies into situations that you would be uncomfortable with is an incredibly rewarding way of paying off players' dedication to learning the nuances of FOB infiltration. As I said, I have never in my life thought this much about the strategies I was using in a video game, even Counter-Strike. Finding out where my limits are and pushing past them, making friends and enemies, making an impression on people like Top Trans Pup Girl when she sees that my username is Frottweiler, getting into infiltration wars with another player only to finally full stealth their FOB to put an end to it, playing the month long game of trying to fly under the radar until I'm equipped enough to start defending myself only to then start really making a splash and infiltrating the more dangerous players' bases, stealing other players' nukes just to decommission them for the betterment of the whole in-game ecosystem. Playing my part in this never-ending, globe-spanning cold war, it's all been an incredible experience, and one that was just hiding in plain sight inside of the most misunderstood and underappreciated Metal Gear game of all time.
salutations. Happy birthday, may your sky stay <laughs> Happy birthday, Snake. <laughs> Happy birthday, boss. Uh, so, yeah, I'm 26 years old now. Um, not really relevant to anything, but, you know. Happy birthday to me. Um... Okay, so before I do the patron read, let me just say one thing right out of the gate. This next video, I'm sure you've heard me teasing it a little bit lately. Teasing might not be the right word. Uh, warning, maybe, is better. Um, it's something I'm really, really, really scared to make. The last video was supposed to be, like, one sort of casual, not really deep video I could make just to give me a little emotional buffer before um, I got to work on this one and I still need a little bit more time so I just made this kind of silly insubstantial video about Metal Gear Solid V um, that you just watched. The only reason I bring it up is it's a bit of a leap of faith to the point where I'd imagine at least some of you this may be the last time you see me after the credits like this. Uh, some of you, probably not, but I, I'll bet a couple of you leave after this. Um, but it's something I gotta make. And other reason I bring it up is because it's kind of the ending to what I did not initially realize was, let's call it a season of Leadhead. Um, a great big long story I've been telling for about 10 months now. This is how that story ends. Um, and it's a happy ending, but I'm horrified to make this video. So while not every single video I've made in the last 10 months has been directly related to this, um, some that I would recommend watching or re-watching if you want to, um, get a better idea of where my head has been at over the last 10 months, which last 10 months is basically the story of the next video. Um, I would recommend watching my Disco Elysium video, the game that defined me is what that was called. Playing Minecraft and losing my apartment, the next one. Um, Love, a video essay. What is the real infinite wealth, a video essay. The puppy girl psychoanalysis. Holding Hands with a Cute Girl and Overcoming Generational Trauma. <sighs> and my most recent video, I'm Kind of a Medical Mystery. It sucks. Um, if you really want to dig into it, you could say that I Kissed My Car, Here's Why, and um, <sighs> maybe even the Trouble in Terrorist Town video are kind of related to what I'll be discussing. Um... But yeah, it's it's something I'm really scared to make. I've already started work on the script, and it's it's going to be really heavy stuff. Um, I I can't imagine my life will ever get dark enough again that I'll even have a topic for another video that would be this challenging for me to make, um, and this scary. But I can also say, like all my videos, this one has a happy ending, um, a really happy ending actually. I have a. Uh, amazing news that you can go to my Twitter if you really want to see. Otherwise, I'd kind of rather not spoil it, because it works really nicely as an ending to this super scary video that's coming out. Um, I've already been at this for 3 minutes 40, though, so... <coughs> Sorry, I was a little bit sick recently. 
Um, let's go ahead and read off the patron names. Um, as always, I would like to thank the patrons who make these videos possible and put me in a position to do really bold stuff like what's about to happen, um, especially those who donate $10 or more monthly, such as Fia Westfall, Autumn Hawk, Ion Luster, River Moon, Marcy, Neo Lunatics, Chase Cares, Olivia, Agatha Sorceress, hold up, let me expand the list, Rogue Planet, Lovely Lila, Hunticar, Catalina Acadre, Vivian Ling, Clo Clover Blake, I Eat Teeth, Orange Remake, Vit B, Cinema Critic, Edelsis, Bree, Stephanie Starfire, Scott Edwards, Pumpkin, David Brawl, Alex, Isa, One-Eyed Wiley, Maddie Doman, Metamaniac, All Hail Eris, Ave Lunum, Babylon Broken, Narcissus Cookbook, S. Yobatoon, Spooky Ina, Guybrush, Lynn Payne, M. Coy, Hazel Pup, Lake, Eva Knight, Mr. Kokoko, Gwen T, Shay Theus, Nomad Lila Jester, Bjorb, Lily Leones, Neris, Fia, Sean Hamilton, Haunted Mystic, Charlotte, Rio, Laura M, Atheist, Sylvan Pasco, Joannis, Vega Nelson, Demise, <laughs> Mia Maple, Nicole, George, George, George Rosenbaum, Neurofilter, The Coom Slayer, Summer Celine, Garnet Midnight, Darius Fazier, Yarrow 12, Big Time Jim, Almost Dead Again, Gab, David Kaiser, Erica, Cortisol, K, Leader, Bo Ya, and CeeLo. Um, I really can't tell y'all how scared I am about this video. Um, but I guess I already tried to tell you, so I'm not going to try again. Um, I'll see you when it comes out. Uh, I guess the one other thing I would want to say... Y'all might be mad at me at the start of this next video, um, and that's fair. Um, I would really appreciate it if you'd stick around to the end, um, because it's a really beautiful story, I think, underneath it all. I'm sorry, I'm just being ominous. I'll, <laughs> I'm gonna go get to work on the script. Later, guys.